afternoon. My name is Colleen Cipriani, and I'm the Associate Dean for Inclusive Excellence at the Gillings School of Global Public Health and also an Associate Professor in our Public Health Leadership Program. The Gillings School is located on the beautiful Chapel Hill campus of the University of North Carolina, where it is fall, as depicted by the foliage in my virtual background. I want to first begin by acknowledging long before our campus existed, there were teachers, students, elders, and youth inhabiting the spaces we enjoy today, trading knowledge and goods with one another. North Carolina is home to the Okanichi, Lumbee, Koheri, Halewa Saponi, Eastern Band of Cherokee, Meharin, Saponi, and Wakama Suwan nations, along with many other indigenous peoples living in both tribal homeland and urban in fact, North Carolina has the largest indigenous population east of the Mississippi River. We acknowledge and give thanks to the first peoples of this land and their descendants. We look forward to building upon the honored memories and goodwill of all who walked and labored here before us. We have a two-part goal today in this University Research Week session entitled Advancing Health Equity Solutions at UNC. We are celebrating Dr. Carmen Samuel Hodge as our very first winner of the Gillings Health Equity Research Award. Dr. Samuel Hodge is an associate professor in our Department of Nutrition, and she is affiliated with the UNC Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention. Congratulations, Carmen. Thank you. The second goal we have today is to highlight the ways in which UNC researchers from across campus are advancing health equity solutions. We will have short talks first by Dr. Samuel Hodge, then Dr. Lauren Brinkley Rubenstein, an assistant professor in the UNC School of Medicine's Department of Social Medicine, who is affiliated with the Center for Health Equity Research. Our third and final talk today will be given by Dr. Shauna Cooper in the UNC Department of Psychology and Neuroscience. She is affiliated with the Institute of African American Research here at UNC. Mm -hmm. In the interest of time, we won't read the full bios of any of our speakers today, but those are all available online and the link is in the chat. Thank you, Chrisanna, for putting that link in the chat. I want to encourage all of you, our participants, to submit your questions to the panelists using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Team members are monitoring your questions and we will do our best to address as many as we can during the time we have together this afternoon. The Q&A portion of the webinar will be at the end of all three of our talks, but feel free to submit your questions at any time. This session is currently live on Facebook and is also being recorded. The recording will be available online at the Gillings website in the chat in a few days. My co-moderator today is Dr. Penny Gordon Larson, the Gillings Associate Dean for Research and also a professor in our Department of Nutrition. And I will turn it over to her now to formally recognize Carmen. Penny? Wonderful. Thank you, Colleen. So I am just so pleased to announce the winner of the inaugural Gillings Health Equity Faculty Research Award, which recognizes excellence in research that results in a sustained reduction in public health inequities. And Dr. Samuel Hodge truly embodies the intent of the award. She herself has said, train in the academy, but practice in the real world. <laughs> you are all fortunate to get to hear Dr. Samuel Hodge speak today on her truly impactful translational research and implementation to address diabetes and her work embedded in the Granville Vance Public Health District Health Department. She'll also talk about her important work in mentoring public health students. I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Dr. Samuel Hodge. Thank you, Penny. Good afternoon and Thank you for the honor of receiving the first Gillings Faculty Award for Excellence in Health Equity Research. It is with much humility and gratitude that I accept this award. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues at the Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention for submitting my work for consideration. I'm also thankful for my research mentors and my research collaborators who value and conduct public health research targeting those at highest risk of not achieving their full health potential. Special thanks go to my family, friends, and faith community who have supported me during these decades of work. Next slide, please. In the next few minutes, I will try to encapsulate the research I've conducted as nutrition faculty based at the UNC Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, 
a CDC prevention research center. I will start by highlighting some of my research, then transition to my embedded role at a rural academic health department, and finally, my service in mentoring public health students. Collectively, this work represents a small contribution in the larger efforts to address and eliminate health inequities. Next slide, please. I came to UNC in 1992 from St. John in the US Virgin Islands with one goal in mind, to obtain a PhD and conduct diabetes self-management training intervention research focused on lower income African Americans. Already a dietitian by training with nine years of public health experience, working at local health departments and health centers under my belt, I was eager to start my research training. But there were two other things to address. There was no one in my department with my research interest in type two diabetes. And I didn't, did not know the lived experiences of African-Americans affected by diabetes. Neither was there much published research specific to self-management interventions among African-Americans. Using the resources available to me, I got to work creating a path to reach my goal of developing and evaluating evidence-based behavioral lifestyle interventions to address the well-documented health differences in my target population. My goal was to start with the core elements of what was already proven effective and work with communities to translate that into a solution that would fit people and place. Next slide, please. This is essentially the approach I've used with all my translation and implementation research. First, I engage with and listen to the target population or those affected by the health condition. Then I use that qualitative information to first figure out how to measure the factors influencing the behaviors to be changed. Sometimes this meant developing new measures to assess psychosocial factors influencing behavior changes. The next steps involve adaptation to what was shown to work in other groups, then the design and testing of the behavioral intervention. So now I'll give you a few examples. Next slide, please. A new dawn was my first diabetes trial. It tested the effectiveness of a church-based diabetes self-management intervention. After listening to many African-Americans living with diabetes, the need for peer counselors or exemplars was evident and the church setting was deemed safe and acceptable. In the late 1990s, when I pitched the idea of community diabetes advisors or peer counselors, I was dismissed by state public health leaders addressing diabetes in the black community, but that didn't stop me. I went on to conduct a successful study with peer counselors, which when published in 2009 was one of the first published randomized control trials of a church-based diabetes self-management training program among African-Americans. Today, peer counselors are common. WeightWise was my first behavioral weight loss intervention after working with the weight loss maintenance trial group at Duke University. In the weight loss literature at the time, there were very few studies among low-income women who have a high prevalence of obesity. So we worked with our community partners at HPDP and began adaptations to standard weight loss programs that would fit women receiving care at health departments and health centers. Our adapted intervention was shown to be effective in low-income midlife women with weight loss outcomes better than that typically observed in similar populations. We shared this program with another prevention research center who has adapted it for the deaf population and is now scaling up implementation. My last example is Family Pals and Lifestyle Support, um, which is another first, where I tested the family-centered dyadic approach to address diabetes self-management and prediabetes treatment among African-American adults using a weight loss approach. After years of listening to patients with diabetes, it became obvious that a family-based approach was culturally appropriate, behaviorally sound, and should be 
developed and tested. So we did that. This trial demonstrated effectiveness in both weight loss and family functioning outcomes. Next slide, please. After conducting these successful trials, I became acutely aware that I really wanted to better understand what it would take to translate research to practice. It was clear that the time from research to practice was entirely too long and the interventions we designed to generate evidence often do not fit well in practice. But I wanted to have a foot in both worlds. To figure that out, I had a conversation with one of the associate deans at Gillings about how to make that happen as a faculty member. She suggested a subcontract with the North Carolina Institute of Public Health, which serves as the outreach arm of the school. This, a little bit of luck, and the vision of Lisa Harrison, the health director at Granville Vance Public Health, explains my embedded role since 2015 in one of only a few rural academic health departments. Next slide, please. So these are some of the things I'm able to do in my embedded role as a translational research and implementation specialist at Granville Vance Public Health. I can leverage UNC resources to address local needs, use my grant writing skills to generate funds that help to address health inequities. I can apply the research skills I possess to improve program delivery and practice and begin to add evaluation research and local data collection to inform decision-making around addressing health issues that disproportionately impact rural communities. I've learned so much during my five years in this embedded role. Next slide, please. Last but certainly not least is my informal mentoring of black graduate students. It was an email from Dr. Shariki Kumanika, who's the founder of what is now the Council on Black Health that started me on this path of mentoring. It started with one postdoc and 11 years later, with the support of many mentees who are paying it forward, we have Sister Docs, which is a network of over a hundred doctoral students, postdocs, and PhD trained black women. My goal was to help students navigate the academy while remaining focused on their educational goals and what brought them to UNC and other local universities in the first place. Our public health workforce is not as diverse as it should be. Neither is our research community. Ensuring that diverse populations are served by public health and healthcare workforces that are also diverse can help to address health inequities when combined with other strategies. As we move toward a much more diverse US population, diversity of health professionals will be even more important. Next slide, please. So in summary, my work will always center around those disadvantaged from achieving their full health potential, while also doing my part in promoting diversity in public health research and practice. But it will take all of us to achieve health equity. Thank you again for this award and for the opportunity to present my work. Thanks so much, Dr. Carmen Samuel Hodge. Congratulations again. We will move to our second speaker, Dr. Lauren Brinkley Rubenstein. Thank you and congratulations again, Carmen. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit today about COVID-19 in the context of correctional settings, so jails and prisons, and really want to start um, by framing this as a racial equity issue. Um, and then think through what we can do together, what the solutions on the table should be relevant to advancing um, health disparity solutions. Um, next slide, please. So the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed these deep-seated inequities among communities of color that people who've doing, been doing this research for a while really um, have been aware of, but they've amplified the social and economic factors that contribute and exacerbate poor health outcomes. The data that we have to date shows that COVID-19 cases where race was specified, 
we see that Black people who comprise only about 13% of the total U.S. population make up about 30% of the COVID-19 cases that have been identified. Next slide. And this is a study that was um, done that really wanted to look at um, percentage differences in share of deaths and cases um, within the general population compared to the African-American share of a population. And so what this found was that while disproportionately black counties account for only about 30% of the US population, they were um, the location of about 50 per, 56% of COVID-19 deaths. And so we see these um, racial disparities that are um, very persistent um, in the context of the pandemic and has certainly highlighted the, the gaps in the safety net and in access to treatment and care in the community. Next slide, please. And I really want to focus on, you know, why this might be and frame this um, relevant to structural factors. I'm trained as a community psychologist and so tend to think uh, in terms of the social ecological model. And so when we think about health disparities, we really have to think about the structural causes that um, impact communities, impact families, and then impact individuals. And there are many different um, factors that are structural causes. And I wanna focus in particular today on incarceration. So mass incarceration is a social structural driver of racial health disparities. People of color, most notably black people are disproportionately harmed by this system. Mass incarceration is highly concentrated in black communities where it causes much damage by ruining social networks, distorting social norms and um, disenfranchisement. Um, incarceration negatively affects health through the dissemination of infectious diseases. It, it is an exposure to primary and secondary stressors. And really in the context of this pandemic, um, there has been more national attention on the, the system of mass incarceration than there has been in the past. And we've seen that correctional facilities, both jails and prisons, um, have really been the epicenter of, of this pandemic. We see that nine of the 10 largest single site cluster outbreaks are in correctional facilities and about 39 of the top 50. And so there's a concentrated disparity in jails and prisons across the nation. Next slide, please. And so why are correctional facilities an amplifier of risk? And so it's for a couple of reasons. People who are incarcerated are at extreme risk of suffering severely from COVID-19. So on average, people who are incarcerated have at least one chronic health condition. There's a high burden of pre-existing conditions like high blood pressure, asthma, which put people at exacerbated risk of COVID-19. We also have an aging population, so about 11% of the prison population in particular is over the age of 55. Next slide, please. And then the other ways in which um, these settings amplify risk is really related to the built environment. So these are congregate living facilities wherein people um, live and sleep in dorm style settings. People eat together, they recreate together, they share bathrooms. Um, and so, and they're also overcrowded on ba at baseline. And so on average, prisons in the United States are about at, at about 104% of capacity. Um, so they're overcrowded at baseline, making social distancing nearly impossible. We've also had a dearth in um, testing access. And so at the very beginning of the pandemic, there was very little access to testing. Um, that continues today, although we've seen gradual increases in availability of testing, um, but testing has really kind of been non-existent. There's also been unclear guidance at the federal level and the state level around um, how we can mitigate risk in these settings and what should be prioritized. Next slide, please. So our group, uh, my lab, the Re-Envisioning Health and Justice Lab in the School of Medicine in March really saw the writing on the wall and knew that these settings would be heavily impacted by COVID-19. So we began to track data that was publicly available. Um, the really important thing here is that um, any of us who, who study uh, prisons and jails, uh, we know that those systems are fairly opaque. And so data are very rarely available. And when they're available, they're usually not available in real time. And so when we saw that most prisons and a lot of the bigger jails were giving us some data um, about COVID, we thought that it was gonna be really important to pay attention and to track those data. 
And so it, it really sort of grew from there. And now to date, we're tracking about um, 65 jails um, and then also 53 prison systems. So all the states are giving us some data. Um, and we're also looking at Puerto Rico, the Federal Bureau of Prisons and um, ICE. And as of yesterday, um, there had been 151,000, a little over 151,000 people who were incarcerated who had been identified to have COVID-19. There had been almost 1,300 deaths of people who were incarcerated. And then we're also tracking numbers among staff, uh, which is another important metric because that's often how um, cases get inside of prisons and jails. So people who work in these settings have exposure in their communities, and then they bring that exposure into um, correctional settings. And so um, we've also uh, tracked and found that about 30,000 staff who work in these settings have, have been diagnosed with COVID-19 and about 70 staff who work in these settings have died. Next slide, please. And so those are numbers and, and without context, those numbers might not mean a lot, but I think that um, this is a really powerful graphic because what it shows is that if we look at the general population, which is that bottom line, um, that sort of tur turquoise line there, that's the general population over time. And you can see that um, staff and people who are incarcerated both have higher rates and have consistently had higher rates um, over the, the course of the pandemic. There's an interesting story here that in some ways acts as evidence for um, the fact that you know this this came into prisons and jails um, via staff. So you can see at the very beginning when we started tracking data in April, that the staff um, rates were higher for about a month, and then the lines crisscrossed, and we see that um, incarcerated people their numbers begin to climb and climb and climb. And so what we see over time is that um, these the risk in these settings are not really being mitigated. We're seeing more testing and still we're seeing um, the cases go up and this um, the gap between the general population and both staff and people who are incarcerated continue to widen. Next slide, please. And I did just want to look, um, you know, we can look at national data and it'll tell us the story, but um, it's also a local story. And, and I wanted to focus in a little bit on what we know about um, case rates among prison staff. And so here we can see that um, it really underscores that story again around, um, among uh, staff and how staff are also um, impacted by this and how they are the um, pathway via which this gets into these institutions. And so here we see by state. And so what we're really looking at is that for a majority of states, the um, risk ratio for staff really outpaces um, that of the general population in a large majority of states. Next slide, please. And finally, I just wanted to focus on um, some of the interim analysis that we've been doing relevant to hotspots. And so the Kaiser Family Foundation has criteria for what is a hotspot and it really revolves around big increases in case rates, um, high positivity rates, and looking at that over a seven day rolling average. And so as we can see many, many states across the country um, qualify as hotspots. Um, and so we can just see that this is really a, a, an issue in a majority of prison systems across the country. Next slide, please. And so, this is an issue. There have been unmitigated outbreaks across the country over the last seven or eight months. So what can we do? We need to reduce populations. We've seen that um, jails to some degree have done this on average, um, sort of in the middle of the pandemic, we saw that jails had reduced their populations um, on average at about 30%. Prisons have not done as great a job. They have average about 5% reduction in population. So there needs to be much more attention paid to reduction in population. I mentioned before that prisons in general are at about 104% of their capacity. And we've done some um, interesting research to try to understand, you know, what is that benchmark that prisons and jails should look for um, relevant to um, population reduction. And we found that if you can reduce populations to 85%, capacity, then the risk of outbreak um, goes down drastically. We also need more testing in the building. We've seen that um, mo lots of places still haven't done much testing at all. Some places have done um, large scale universal testing one time. 
Um, but very few um, systems have articulated a long-term plan around testing that includes testing at intervals, um, prioritizing certain populations for testing, um, giving access to staff for testing, et cetera. So there needs to be more thought around testing and there needs to be more testing. And then the last thing I'll say is that um, for a long time, correctional health and public health have been very siloed. Um, public health in a lot of ways has has marginalized correctional health and not thought of jails and prisons as inside of their purview. Earlier this year, our group put out a special issue of the American Journal of Public Health, really trying to frame mass incarceration as a socio-structural driver of health inequity. And I think that, um, you know, in many ways, public health really needs to take up the cause. And so when we saw um, the pandemic start, what we saw was a lot of jails and prisons who wanted to do more testing, they wanted to uh, engage in more public health interventions, but they didn't know how and they didn't have anyone in the building who had that expertise and they didn't know who to call. Um, some of the systems that are kind of ahead of the curve uh, relevant to um, uh, you know, keeping low rates of, of COVID-19 inside of their facilities are those places where those relationships between public health and corrections already existed. And so I, um, you know, one of the things I've been trying to advocate for is this real need to form those relationships now so that when the second wave really continues to escalate, um, all of the intervention pieces can be in place to keep people safe. And then that those relationships need to be sustainable over time so that um, the next time there's a public health emergency, public health expertise is at the table. Um, thanks so much for, for letting me talk today. Thank you so much, Dr. Lauren Brinkley Rubenstein. Um, we are going to transition now to our third speaker, Dr. Shauna Cooper. I want to remind our attendees to please ask your questions in the Q&A portion of the webinar. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, today I will be sharing some of my work focused broadly on fathering and well-being among African-American men, um, the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Um, so much of my work examines how social context, in particular, how the broader racial context shapes parenting and family systems, as well as the implications for children and youth. A key part of this work has been given the relative inattention to Black fathers um, is reflecting their experiences and perspectives on the broader family process. With that said, for the brief time that I am with you today, I wanted to focus on some of uh, my recent work on COVID-19 work context in relation to potential implications for Black fathers, as well as potential compounding and cascading effects on families. Also, as we continue to talk about these issues more broadly, uh, next slide. Um, I wanted to end the presentation uh, with continuing next steps to further advance equity for fathers, families, and communities more broadly. Next slide. So uh, we know that Black families and communities continue to be disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Um, we also see elevated risk in Indigenous, Asian, and Latinx communities. And as the, the pandemic has continued to unfold, uh, we've increasingly talked about how existing racial and or social inequities are being exacerbated or further intensified. Um, and what are the intergenerational impacts of this intensification? Next slide. So we know that in addition to a number of factors, age, uh, pre-existing health conditions, uh, work characteristics have been suggested as uh, being related to COVID-19 outcomes and our uh, risk. So we know that studies have indicated that roughly 20 to 30% of African-Americans have been able to work from home or remotely during the pandemic. We also know that African-American and Latinx workers are disproportionately represented in essential and frontline occupations. Many of them mothers and fathers, 
And I think if we think back to earlier this year, uh, some of the earliest victims, men like uh, Jason Hargrove, Hargrove to my right, um, a husband and father uh, was a frontline worker and worked in public transportation in Detroit. So as an extension of some of my existing work, with Black fathers and families, we wanted to examine how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting broader family and or household dynamics. And then what are the implications, not just for fathers' well-being, but what are the implications for children as well? So what we found was a multi-layered story um, that we continue to uh, piece together as we continue to look at more and more um, of the data. Um, and so what we have found is that work context and characteristics um, seem to be critical for understanding not just fathers' well-being outcomes during the pandemic, but also for how families are functioning more broadly. Next slide. So I wanted to give a quick, quick snapshot of the data um, that I am referencing today. Um, and as, as we talk about the experiences of Black fathers, I think it's important to have a good sense of who they are. Um, and so the data presented today are from a sample of 498 Black fathers um, from across the country. Um, data were collected in June or July of this year, uh, which represented uh, a period of consistent increase in the number of COVID-19 cases across the country. And so 41% of fathers reside in the southeastern region. However, uh, the remaining 59% are split relatively um, even across the Midwest, Northeast, and Western regions. 47% of Fathers in this sample were married. Uh, however, a si sizable uh, number of fathers were single, never married, uh, separated or divorced, or living together, uh, living together but not currently married. Um, we also have some di diversity across education level. 14% of our fathers reported not currently having health insurance. Next slide, please. So again, our initial goal was to uh, get a sense or have a better sense of how fathers and their families are adapting and responding during, during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as their coping with ongoing racial stressors. Um, but work has emerged as a critical part of the story. So for example, 46 percent of fathers in our sample were essential are frontline workers. Um, also, 31 percent noted that they work in contexts that are considered at higher risk for contracting COVID-19. Uh, 29 percent reported living with someone who also worked in a context that was considered at higher risk for contracting COVID-19. Um, almost half of our fathers reported a moderate to severe change in family income at that point uh, during the pandemic. Um, not just loss of their income, but also uh, someone in their, their household or family. And again, I think this speaks to uh, thinking about individuals and choices and motivations and the continued work in settings that made high risk and the need to make up for loss of income. Next slide. So we have also seen how work context is related to father's well-being. And so what we have found is that after adjusting for several, several demographic factors, uh, working in a high-risk context for contracting COVID-19 uh, was related to a greater anxiety and depressive symptoms among fathers in our sample, as well as sleep deter uh, disturbance, um, but not overall sleep quality. Next slide. So we also examined how uh, work in a high-risk 
context for contracting COVID was associated with pandemic health outcomes. And again, thinking about how this broader, uh, this reality may shape not just individual well being, but have implications for how families are um, adapting and uh, how they're responding uh, over the duration of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so 34%, so across our entire sample, 34% of fathers reported a personal diagnosis of COVID-19. 21% um, of fathers reported a diagnosis of a close relative. And again, the close relative, partner, spouse, child, or parent. Um, however, I will say that there was quite a range. So uh, from at least having, from fathers reporting, having at, at least one close relative who was diagnosed all the way to the upper end of nine plus, 10 plus close relatives who had been diagnosed with COVID-19. And so we also, after adjusting for several demographic factors, found that fathers who reported working in a higher risk context were more likely to report a personal diagnosis and diagnosis of a close relative. Next slide. So as I have talked about the individual implications, not just for fathers' well-being, mental health well-being, and also their pandemic outcomes, I wanted to extend the discussion and discuss how uh, the work context, uh, fathers' well-being are also spilling over or what I have been calling cascade into family or community context. And so some of our work is continuing to show that uh, fathers' work context and demands uh, over the duration of the pandemic um, are associated with greater family discord. Um, in addition, we see a number of things uh, unfolding that are in line uh, with, with the existing literature, but also speak to, again, uh, the potential compounding effects of uh, work stress within the context of COVID-19 as well as the exacerbation of existing racial and or social inequities. So some of our data has uh, shown increased uh, levels of parenting stress and role strain. And role strain is particularly important for many men and fathers. We also have seen uh, that shifting, so social support systems have shifted or they have been lost. And 30%, 36% of fathers um, in our uh, study noted a moderate to severe loss in family and social support uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, we have seen some issues emerge for non-residential fathers in comparison to fathers who are residential, in particular of the uh, access in terms of uh, visitation, being able to uh, see their children. And as we look at the responses by fathers, many have noted concern about elevating risk, so not wanting their children to also be exposed uh, to, to COVID-19 risk but they have also spoken to restrictions on travel, um, time uh, working too much or increased work hours or inflexible work hours as barriers to spending time uh, with their children during the pandemic. Um, also, some of our data is, as, is speaking to, for many families, so not just Black families, but families more broadly, issues around schooling and remote learning. And that for parents, who were not able uh, to work from home or ro work remotely, how they negotiate remote learning within this context, as well as broader technology and internet access issues. Also, as we speak specifically to the experiences of uh, Black families, but also other families of color, thinking about COVID amidst ongoing acts of racism um, and what this means for men's well-being. So some of our work has spoken to increased stress and the ways in which fathers are coping. Um, we've also extended it to look at um, other issues around mask wearing. So some of our fathers and we're seeing relationship between fathers concern or prior experiences with discrimination 
and concerns about mask wearing. So again, thinking about how uh, the broader racial context has shaped adaptation, coping, stress, response over the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in addition to speaking to how fathers uh, are responding and their overall well-being, it's important to acknowledge how fathers and as well as other important others in the lives of youth are helping youth and supporting youth as they also cope with these issues. Next slide. So as I have talked about how work context amidst COVID-19 may have implications for Black fathers and families, um, I think that there are some continuing and important steps um, in terms of not just speaking to individual outcomes, but also family and community level outcomes, as well as what this can mean intergenerationally. So with that said, a systems level equity approach is critical. Uh, one that reflects the experiences and centers the voices of Black fathers um, and families. Also thinking about increased advocacy and action, um, including strategic partnerships, and that strategic partnerships uh, in terms of increased uh, resource and access, but also thinking about strategic support to strategic partnerships, excuse me, as uh, they help support fathers, but also help fathers as they support uh, their family members, their children, as well as others in their community. And I think we cannot ignore the role of policy, thinking about work, employment policy, uh, child care policy as part of this broader discussion. Last, I will leave you with, as we talk about how things are unfolding for uh, families more broadly amidst COVID-19, I will say is that we cannot think of this as only a response to COVID-19 if we're truly focused on advancing equity. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you all. We have a few questions here. I'm going to jump right in. And um, this one is for you, Shauna. Um, Laura Lenan says, thanks for this great presentation. How were respondents defined as essential or frontline workers? Was there some sort of definition offered? And did respondents indicate yes or no? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. Um, so yeah, so fathers had both a, there are a couple of ways in which we asked, we did ask this question. So there was a, a question around, are you an essential or frontline worker? There was a separate question around, do you work in a healthcare setting? And so those were yes, no responses, but there was a, um, a brief definition of what that, what that, what that was. Thank you. Lauren, this one goes to you, an anonymous attendee will ask, can data on health risks and disparities in prisons be summarized and presented to middle and high school students in an effort to further discourage behaviors that would lead to incarceration? Teenagers often feel invincible and likely do not think about potential adverse health effects in the prison environment. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's a, um, uh, a good question and uh, definitely an issue. I think a lot of people who, you know, aren't in this work or haven't experienced incarceration themselves or in their families don't really understand the more um, comprehensive impacts that incarceration can have on people. And that includes um, their health, the health of their families, and also all of these collateral consequences, such as, you know, lack of access to um, certain types of housing or jobs or uh, loss of the right to vote, et cetera. And so I think a more um, comprehensive understanding of those things um, would help people to truly understand, uh, you know, what a large impact um, being incarcerated um, has on, on people. But, you know, most of my work is really less thinking about individual behavior and more thinking about structural factors. And so thinking about, you know, why do police uh, like, or how do we intervene so that police don't um, patrol 
you know, communities of color more than others. And so, you know, there's this whole other structural part of it too that I think is also missing from um, the comprehension of, of a lot of uh, white people in particular. Thank you, Lauren. Carmen, I wanna go back to you for a minute. I do know that you answered this question. Um, you, wrote, you wrote an answer, but for the purposes of the recording, I'd like to give you an opportunity to answer it um, verbally. So the question is, and it comes from Isabel Lou, do you think that the nutrition field has failed to address racial inequities in food and health outcomes is due in part to a lack of qualitative research that explores the lived experiences of people of color, particularly black Americans? Yeah, so um, I, I responded to this question by saying one of the issues in understanding context is having a diverse group of people representing a profession. And I can give you an example. There, 2% of dietitians are Black. That in and of itself poses a problem in the sense that the level of comfort with the professionals actually figuring out and understanding the context in which these behaviors occur is going to be limited. And so to that extent, I think that's part of the problem. The profession is not diverse enough to have the conversations with um, populations such that that information can then inform practice and or how you approach dealing with issues related to food. Thank you. We have a, another question about um, your research projects and how uh, students and faculty, other faculty members can get involved with the, um, some of the research that you all are doing. So I'll start first with Shauna. Well, I will say is that my lab, the Star Lab, Strengths, Assets, and Resilience Lab is always, always, <laughs> always recruiting uh, new, new people to contribute to projects, not just on fathering, but thinking about Black families and communities more broadly um, speaking and uh, more broadly defined, and also thinking about translation, right? So all of the things that I talked about in my talk were really around how this impacts the day-to-day -day experiences, the health outcomes, the school outcomes of Black, uh, Black children and or, uh, you know, other, you know, family, parents, but also other, other family members. And so speaking to not just uh, researching the issue, but we have opportunities to think about what this means for families and communities every day. Okay. Thanks, Shauna. Lauren? Um, I'll echo Shauna. We also are <laughs> always looking for new people to, to join the lab. And um, we actually just got a bunch of funding. We were, um, uh, Congress put aside a bunch of money for COVID health disparity research. And our lab was one of 32 funded um, grants, the only one to look at COVID to try to think about ethical issues relevant to COVID vaccines and testing in correctional facilities. Um, and so we, we're looking for people and collaborators and I'd, I'd love for anybody who's interested to get in touch. Carmen? Yeah, so there are two, two avenues of um, engagement. First, um, HPDP welcomes um, student volunteers and we encourage them to come and see some of the projects that we're working on. In addition, being in the nutrition department, um, students who come into the BSPH, the Bachelor of Science in Public Health program, many of them have contacted me and worked with me during their last two years of their programming. So that's another avenue by which students can get involved. Um, yeah, so those are probably the two main um, avenues. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Carmen, this question is from David Braithwaite. He wants to know, Dr. Hodge, are you doing any diabetes testing or implementation in your hometown in the U.S. Virgin Islands? I know the name. He's, we went to school together. Oh. <laughs> yeah, N no, I haven't. Tell the VI government to contact me. <laughs> There's the answer. So here's another question from Stephen Boyer. He um, asks of, of any of you, can anyone speak to trends in COVID-19 in queer and trans communities locally? I'm curious about disparities made apparent given that healthcare providers can deny transgender patients care. 
Is that something any of you all can speak to? I can't speak to it, but I know who can. So um, okay. Tonya Potit, who is um, another faculty member in the Center for Health Equity Research, does really amazing and important research um, with the trans community and has been some doing some um, stuff in Durham in particular. And so um, if anyone, you could find her on the internet or I'd be happy to make that connection. Thanks, Lauren. Another question for you, Carmen, is about Sister Docs. Tell us some more about that organization. How does one join? Are you accepting new members? <laughs> All right, so Sister Doc is really just an informal networking of um, doctoral students, postdocs, and faculty. Um, it, as I mentioned in the presentation, it started with one conversation where a postdoc was feeling a little bit alienated and um, we met at Foster's when it was Foster's, had a conversation over coffee, tea and that, and then another person joined and another person joined because there needed to be an opportunity for, for black students to feel welcome to feel comfortable in the space of the academy. And, and oftentimes they needed to figure out how to navigate the academy. And so that's how it started. Um, and we kept it informal such that the whole idea was, it's this concept called the strengthening weak ties to the extent that you're connected, even though the ties may be weak, it allows you to feel um, part of a group and that feeling gives you the opportunity to really um, build on the resources of the group and also feel welcome and the, and, and the fact that you can then figure out how to succeed in a system that doesn't, is not really designed intentionally for you to succeed. I mean, you might get membership, but it, it takes a minute for you to figure out how to get to that endpoint. So that's what we do. Um, anyone interested in joining Sister Docs can email me and I can make you a part of it. So, and it, it's not limited to UNC, it can be any black doctoral student or postdoc. Thank you, Carmen. Um, Lauren, another question for you. You mentioned in your talk um, that we need to have more um, uh, uh, collaborations between individuals who are in public health to do to 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 further study incarcerated populations. What 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 would that look like? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it can look a number of different ways, and I think it can happen at the research level. Or it can also happen at the public health practice level. Um, and so, you know, way a long time ago, all of the medical healthcare provision inside of these settings was, um, you know, could be uh, monitored, provided by public departments of health, um, and that has changed. And so there's very few actual um, public health departments who are the ones who are providing healthcare. It's really turned into a very a corporatized system. So a lot of private healthcare companies, which is in part some of the problem. Um, so one way would be to engage public health people in the communities in the actual provision of healthcare. Um, it could also look like managing the contract. So sometimes that happens where you have a, um, a corporate healthcare entity, but the public health department is managing that contract because they sort of know what should be in there and what is good public health practice. The other um, thing is just really thinking through, you know, when we have um, public health interventions at the table, like who should be design designing them, who should be providing input. You know, um, many jails and prisons now are implementing uh, methadone, suboxone, MOUD programs, and those usually don't include public health partners. Um, so anytime we're just thinking about innovation or healthcare in these settings or the public reporting of data, public health departments really need to think about how that is in their purview. Um, and I think it's as easy maybe sometimes as uh, people in charge reaching out to each other. That's what we've seen in some systems around here is just making that original, that first connection and then letting it happen from there. But um, yeah, but like those things don't even exist, those connections to send an email. So I think it, we can start small and then think big. 
Thanks, Lauren. I'm going to take this question from Brittany Menchian, and I'm going to ask um, Shauna you to take a first crack at it. From a racial and health equity stance, what research has been done to encourage African Americans to take the COVID-19 vaccine and understand resistance to vaccination? What studies are being conducted to discuss community-based interventions in Black communities related to COVID-19? So I will answer maybe a part, maybe all part, but I'll try to answer <laughs> a part of it. And so I, I think that as we were talking about at least the first part of the question around um, encouraging uh, uh, Black communities and other communities of color to, to take the vaccine, I think that was the first part of the question. I think that there's a social historical lens in which we understand uh, that decision making. And so it, it, you know, we can think about it in terms of encourage, encouragement of taking the vaccine, but I think the broader racial and social historical context um, you know, there's several, several events, you know, that pull into that um, and really sort of thinking about how the legacy of those, those uh, events and what they mean for decision making in the, in the context of, of, of COVID-19 uh, vaccines. And so mm -hmm. I think that's, that's what I would say. And I know that there are a number of, of studies that are looking at that currently within the specific context of COVID-19, but we can also pull from existing studies that look at, um, you know, research on sort of the, you know, thinking about legacy of Tuskegee, uh, the Tuskegee study, as well as other studies that have impacted health behavior uh, within uh, Black, uh, not just Black communities, but other communities of color. Thanks, Shauna. Carmen and Lauren, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I'll say, you know, our group has been doing a lot of thinking around um, vaccine deployment in correctional facilities. We also wrote um, an article uh, that was in JAMA last month looking at um, clinical trial enrollment among people who are incarcerated, which is a very fraught um, topic. And to Shauna's point, lots and lots and lots of ethical missteps and mistreatment and um, torture, um, you know, in the past. So, um, but we have advocated for um, people who are incarcerated currently and people who have been incarcerated to have their voices centered really front and center in these discussions. And so if we are to, um, you know, do any clinical trial stuff, really people who are in these settings have to tell us whether that's okay or not. And then as far as vaccine deployment and um, prioritization, a lot of these lists aren't putting people who are incarcerated in the top tier, which I think is a giant problem. You know, we're not treating other congregate settings in that way. We've um, prioritized skilled nursing facilities and other um, places where people are at extreme risk, but we have put um, people who are incarcerated lower down the list. And so I think that is um, um, a giant problem and something that folks need to advocate um, for them to really be in tier one. That's not really what you asked, but I just wanted to like, um, you know, there's a whole issue of like, how does it work and how do we get it right? But I also think it, there's this persistent marginalization that is continuing to happen. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for, for that information. You guys raised good points on the history and um, how we need to learn from that history. Um, Delisha Stewart, Lauren has another question for you. With so much privatization of the criminal justice system, who has oversight on state and federal levels? Who is managing the COVID crisis in prisons? Yeah, it's a great question. So I like to say, um, you know, you've been in one jail, you've been in one jail. So it's very different in, in, in different settings. It's different in jails, different into one jail to the next jail. So it kind of depends on where you're at. Um, even if a facility is privatized, even if a, a healthcare entity is privatized inside of a jail or prison, um, governmental, there's still governmental oversight. And so, you know, the DOCs um, or the sheriffs, whoever sort of managing that entity is still really kind of the final decider. Um, and so there is oversight, but there are not a lot of mechanisms for um, accountability um, that are in place. And so part of what our group has been pushing for is data transparency um, to try to further uh, accountability. Thanks, Lauren. Shauna, this question is for you. Can you say a little bit more about support for the African-American fathers in your study? I mean, how and where are they finding support for their concerns? Um, and, and, and what more needs to be done? So, you know, in two, two minutes or two seconds, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and so I think that, you know, even if we think about this outside of, 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 of COVID-19, we can think about how, um, uh, at least in the work, we've been pushing both to understand father's experiences, but also how those experiences are a context for how they engage with their children. And uh, we, a lot of the work in the lab is within the context of racism. So how fathers own experiences with racism shape how they discuss those issues or even how they um, help to um, both sort of prepare and, um, you know, help their children de develop ad adaptive coping. And and so that's a different skill set, right? So there's both the sort of support around the, the issues that fathers have had, their own experiences, their own racial traumas. And then there's another level of support about what that means to also support their children, not just around issues of race or discrimination, but more broadly. And we know that parents' experiences are uh, really impactful for how they engage with their children. And uh, acknowledging those experiences are key in that broader parenting uh, process. And so it's really sort of thinking about how all of these things are not just at the individual level, but what they mean for how families, uh, how families function. Um, and so social supports could be both in terms of parenting. So our fathers, uh, not just, not in this study, but in our other data often say people never ask about parenting related things. And so they refer to their partners, yeah. their spouse as always being asked but never, people never ask them and mm -hmm. that they want the opportunity to be able to discuss not just broadly in terms of the, the support they need, but speaking specifically to um, how to support their children. And, you know, as a developmental psychologist that changes. So when kids are earlier support, a different support is needed. When kids mm -hmm. are adolescents and all these things are coming at them, to, you know, every day, that's where fathers also voice the need for support in helping their children navigate a sort of complex social, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shauna. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Penny Gordon Larson, who will close us out. Thank you all. Excellent, thank you. And thank you so much, Colleen, for your excellent, graceful leadership here. And to Dr. Samuel Hodge, Dr. Brinkley Rubenstein, Dr. Cooper, for your amazing, outstanding talk and your work, um, really fabulous work to address structures that lead to health inequities. All of you are doing such transformative and impressive work. It was really a, a fabulous session. And to the audience, thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.